I want to thank the Charlestown Historical Society, Charlestown Preservation Society, and Friends of City Square Park for making tonight possible. City Square, a fight for survival. The following are three timelines that cover this period. The first timeline was from 1629 to 1775. Puritans from New England arrived to create a settlement based on their religious beliefs. The second period was from 1776 to 1899. After the American Revolution, Charlestown rebuilt with its marketplace becoming Charlestown Square and later City Square. Bridges, better roads, a busy port, and the railroads brought importance to the City Square area as a location, and with that came population growth. The third period was from 1900 to 1990. The elevated railway came to City Square, then World War I, the 1930s Depression, World War II. Population peaked in the early 1900s, then declined through the 1970s. The 1970s saw the removal of the L, a new Rutherford Avenue and building renovation. The city of Boston had plans for Charlestown that included a major interchange replacing City Square, which resulted in a town that was more determined to fight for survival. After 1990, we seem to be in a new timeline, as it is witnessing the emergence of a new City Square area. Before the English settlers arrived, the area was inhabited for thousands of years by the Pawtucket Indians, and the area was known as Mishawam. The natives cultivated the land, hunted and fished everywhere. But when the English arrived in 1629, they found that 90% of the New England Indians had already died from the plague brought by earlier explorers. On June 24, 1629, when Thomas Graves and the hundred Puritan settlers arrived, they were greeted cordially by the Pawtucket Indians. The settlers purchased the land and proceeded to build the Great House, shown in green, in what is now City Square Park, for the soon-to-arrive Governor Winthrop. Meanwhile, they lived in primitive huts and tents until small houses could be built later. Graves named the new settlement Charlestown in honor of the English king. Also laid out were Main Street and a path leading up to Town Hill, where a fort was built. Somewhere between Town Hill and the waterfront and near the Great House, a meeting house was built. The Great House may have looked like this artist drawing of the 1635 Boston townhouse. However, the Great House served only three months as the colony's seat of government. The building then became the Three Cranes Tavern. In 1635, Robert Long bought the building with an attached house to be used by his family. Around it was an area known as the Marketplace, and it soon buzzed with trade, barter, and sales once a week. A night at the tavern was different than going to a tavern today, in that patrons would have been expected to share not only their dinner table, but food as well. Food was served on large wood platters, which could be shared by several people. Patrons might also share their tankards, or perhaps a large pot of warm milk, rum, and spices. It was not until the middle of the 18th century that people started using individual plates, cups, or even forks. A new meeting house was built nearby in 1716 and a courthouse in 1735. The town stocks, whipping post, and pillory were also in this area, and they saw a lot of use. John Winthrop was the first governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. He and eleven ships arrived in the new Charlestown colony in 1630. He lived at the new Great House with other important leaders. It is here, he stated, for we must consider that we shall be as a city on a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us. The Puritans wanted to establish a new community based on the worship of God and hard work. During the first 75 years of settlement, the general court, with the support of the Puritan church, passed many laws that tried to regulate people's behavior. For example, there were laws against local residents wasting productive hours, loitering, singing, dancing, playing games, or drinking. 
It was even made illegal to sell cakes or buns, except for special occasions. The water supply, however, was found to be unsuitable and insufficient, and after only three months, Governor Winthrop, with other officials and a few settlers, relocated to what would become Boston. The assistance of the governor and the company of the Massachusetts Bay met on August 23, 1630, and organized the Court of Assistance. This was succeeded in 1781 by the Supreme Judicial Court. When John Harvard arrived in Charlestown in 1637, he lived somewhere in the Harvard Mall area. He became an assistant preacher at the First Church. When he died a year later, he gave half of his estate and his library of 320 volumes to a college in Cambridge. The grateful Massachusetts General Court named the college after him, which is now Harvard University. In the Charlestown area, several women are worth mentioning. After the Indian leader Sagamore John had been killed by hostile Indians, a woman called Squaw Satcham became the new Indian leader. Margaret Jones was a nurse, but unfortunately excited the professional jealousy of the town physicians because she cured with herbs and peppermint what they could not master with blue pills, bleeding, or by other means. In 1648, she was accused of witchcraft, found guilty, and was the first woman to be sentenced to death in New England for the crime of witchcraft. In times of restricted rights and opportunities, businesswoman Mary Long was able to inherit the Three Cranes Tavern from her husband. Grace Parker also inherited and successfully petitioned the general court to transfer the redware and stoneware-making rights of the Parker pottery to herself. And then there is Elizabeth Forster Goose, also known as Mother Goose, but that might only be a fairy tale. By 1638, some 70 small houses stood in the town. The marketplace, shown in red, is where the Three Cranes Tavern was located. On the right is where the town dock and a new fort were located. Today, that dock would be where Warren, Henley, and Park Streets all come together. A ferry existed for more than 150 years for those people wishing to travel between Boston and Charlestown. When Governor Winthrop moved to Boston, he also took the church leadership, and for the next two years, churchgoers had to take the ferry to church in Boston. Charlestown, by 1775, was a good-sized town of 400 houses and public buildings. The town was a major port for commerce to and from Europe and claimed the greatest volume on trade of all Massachusetts ports except Boston. The center of all activities and the focus of major streets were in the marketplace, shown in red, where the Three Cranes Tavern, a new meeting house recognizable by its tall steeple, the Middlesex County Circuit Courthouse, and the Parker Harris Pottery were all located. The spring of 1775 would see the beginning of enormous change after the shot that would be heard around the world. Paul Revere rose over to Charlestown from the North End, April 19, 1775, and borrows a horse from Deacon John Larkin. This is the Boston area on the eve of the Paul Revere and William Dawes ride to Concord. The map shows the route Paul Revere took in blue, the route of William Dawes in green, and the route by British regulars in red. All were heading for Concord. In 1775, the Three Cranes Tavern was popular with American rebel soldiers, which perhaps explains why archaeologists found many musket balls in the privies. It also must have been a noisy and rowdy place in 1775, with English soldiers and American patriots drinking in the tavern at the same time. During the Battle of Bunker Hill, American rebels used the Three Cranes Tavern and the steeple of the Meeting House to fire on British positions. This resulted in returned action, destroying those buildings, along with the rest of Charlestown. Tourists today, who hurry across from Boston up to the monument, do not often realize when they are in the middle of City Square Park 
they are on another historic Battle of Bunker Hill site. Although these buildings stood in the marketplace until the battle, no drawings exist of what they looked like. The Battle of Bunker Hill on June 17, 1775, saw the complete destruction of the town. Residents of the North End watched the battle and burning of Charlestown. After the Battle of Bunker Hill, Charlestown began to rebuild. Streets were straightened, widened, and extended. The town bought the land where the great house, meeting house, and court once stood, and decided no buildings would be built in the middle of the square. The Charles River Bridge was built by developers in 1786 as a toll bridge. In 1800, the U.S. government opened the first naval shipyard in Charlestown, bringing prosperity and jobs. Other bridges that soon followed were between Charlestown and Everett in 1787, Charlestown and Chelsea in 1803, and Prison Point Bridge in 1816. These bridges caused traffic in the square to become so great, a second bridge, the Warren Avenue Bridge, was built in 1828, connecting Charlestown Square and Boston. Charlestown resident Nathaniel Gorham was a signer of the Constitution, and in 1786 he was elected President of Congress. This was one of many elected positions that he held. He lived in a wood house on the marketplace near Main Street. When he died, his funeral was one of the largest ever held in the town. In the square, a new town hall in 1818 was built, shown in blue on the map. Other new buildings were built around a European-style open plaza that was officially named Charlestown Square. A few years later, a formal circular green space with an elegant fountain in the middle and ornate fence around it was built. Omnibus service between Charlestown and Boston started in 1828. The 1820 map shows a growing town. Sullivan Square on the upper left is still a narrow peninsula that during very high tides made Charlestown an island. On this map are visible Mill Pond and New Bridges, one to Boston and one to Cambridge. Charlestown Square is located at bottom right. The 1818 Town Hall was built on the corner of the Marketplace and Harvard Street. Following English tradition, the first floor had commercial usage, while town hall offices and its auditorium were on the upper floors. Town offices had their entrances on Harvard Street. It was used as a town hall for 30 years and as Charlestown's City Hall for 20 years. Long before the YMCA was built, this site included the stately home of James Russell. The building on the right, owned by John Harris, was once a residence with a store on the first floor that later became the Middlesex House. Behind these buildings was an area of tenements called Dublin Row. The large tree to the right was said to have been planted before the Revolution. In the decades after the Revolution, horse-drawn cabs were popular. Often would be found Fish Burnett's cab with his famous horse Dolly. Decades later, the square was also where Hawthorne's coaches, that traveled to different surrounding towns, waited for passengers at the flagstones, which made a footwalk across the square running north and south. The tracks of the Middlesex Horse Railroad ran parallel to the flagstones. The 1780 Russell Mansion was a residence, but by 1835, the area had become so congested it became an unpleasant place to live. It was later used as a hotel with the name of Mansion House. It became a public house but was not well maintained and was demolished in 1866. The opening of bridges to Charlestown created a building boom and increased the need for hotels. The National Hotel, also called the Nash by locals, was located on the corner of Chelsea Street and the former Joyner Street. Joyner Street was near where the recently extended part of Warren Street is now located. The Nash was a popular hotel for an assortment of guests that included naval officers, travelers, farmers, and even circus performers. The old Nash 
was also a popular place for local political groups to assemble. Candidates for office framed their campaigns at the popular bar and at the dining tables. The old Nash was the clearinghouse for most of the different ideas concerning the community. The night before city hall meetings or before an election time, the old Nash was quite the place to be at. The Charlestown Enterprise. In 1835, a fire destroyed most of the buildings in Charlestown Square and all the waterfront buildings down to the Navy Yard. After the fire, the town dock was filled in and the area was redeveloped. Chelsea Street was laid out along with a series of new streets connecting Chelsea Street and Water Street, replacing 18th century alleys. Charlestown Square saw new banks, restaurants, stores, meeting halls, and a post office. This is a bird's eye view looking from Monument Square to Boston. Charlestown Square is top right. Charlestown's population continued to grow. The 1840s marked the arrival of the railroad in Charlestown. The export of ice from area ponds was developing into a thriving industry. Ice storage buildings were located on Tudor Wharf near the square. These changes encouraged Irish immigrants to settle in Charlestown, and in a decade, population doubled to 25,000. The town became a city in 1847, and Charlestown Square was renamed City Square. Charlestown greets the members of the City Guard returning from Washington, D.C. in 1857 after attending the inauguration of President Buchanan. In 1866, a new elegant hotel, the Waverly House, was built by Moses Dow in the square next to the Mansion House. The new hotel had stores on the first floor with Abbotsford Hall on the Rutherford Ave side. Dow also built 12 brick townhouses on Harvard Street. To the left is the Mansion House. The 1870 addition to the Waverly House, shown on the left, replaced the old Mansion House and other buildings, doubling the size of the Waverly House. The street to the left of the hotel leads to the Warren Avenue Bridge. A building boom after 1865 transformed the facade of the square. The new elegant Waverly House, shown in green, was followed in 1868 by an impressive French Second Empire-style city hall, shown in blue. It was built on the site of Old Town Hall. Most of its life, the building was used as the town library. The circular park is shown in red. Also note the location of Charles River Avenue and the area I call the waterfront. In this area, the streets between Chelsea and Water with the names of Chamber, Joyner, Hudson, Gray, Foss, Maudlin, and Wapping. The city of Charlestown voted to become part of the city of Boston in 1874. Remember, by mid-1775, Charlestown lay in ruins. Let us now do an 1875 walking tour of City Square by starting on the 1786 Charles River Bridge and looking towards City Square. The buildings along the waterfront were the well-known Tudor Wharf. Next is the E.T. Cowdery Company, which produced jellies, canned goods, pickles, and sauces. It was located between Tudor Wharf on its right and the railroad tracks to its left. There was another building, very similar in every way to the E.T. Cowdery Building, and that was between the railroad tracks and Water Street, and it was a chair company. Both buildings were at one time owned by Tudor Wharf Company and used as Mill No. 1 and Mill No. 2. This interesting block of buildings on Charles River Avenue between Water Street and City Square represent the waterfront area. This area had a mixture of residential buildings and businesses that existed between Chelsea Street and Water Street. The buildings in this photo and much of Charles River Avenue were destroyed by a multi-alarm fire in 1936. The 1786 bridge was removed when the new wider 1901 Charlestown Bridge was built. We are now looking at the 1875 Triumphal Arch that was built between City Square and Charles River Avenue. 
the triumphal arch was erected for the 100th anniversary of the Battle of Bunker Hill. The only part of once busy Charles River Avenue which still exists today is an unused area between the Charlestown Bridge and the Marriott Hotel. This worker is waiting for the day to start. To the left is the new Waverly House, and to its right is a narrow street named Rutherford Ave. To the far left is a portion of the Waverly House, then there is Rutherford Ave, then a small group of buildings, and on their right is Harvard Street, and a part of the former City Hall that had a new use as the town library. From where we are standing, we see from left to right the Waverly House and the park with its fountain. Behind the fountain is the 1868 former City Hall and town library with its beautiful domed roof. It was only used as City Hall for six years because of Charlestown becoming part of Boston, but the library use continued. To its right, you can see the tower of the first church that was on Harvard Street, and right of that is Main Street. If we look closer at Main Street, we see some historic buildings. Three of these buildings will be replaced by the entrance to the Harvard Mall, named in honor of John Harvard, whose home was once here. At the far right are some three-story buildings that will be where Rogan Hall is today. These brick buildings were occupied by the Bunker Hill Bank. Looking from the square and to the left is Park Street, and to its right is Chelsea Street. We are now back at the Triumphal Arch and looking towards the Charles River Avenue and Boston. This view of the Warren Avenue Bridge, also known as the Low Bridge, is looking towards City Square. It existed from 1828 till 1962. The bridge was a drawbridge, and numerous ships and schooners passed through, and when they did, traffic backed up on both sides of the bridge. It is interesting to note that people who walked to Boston through Paul Revere Park and the locks in 2014 are walking almost the same route as if the Warren Bridge was still there today. And when boats pass through the locks, people on both sides have to wait to cross. Here's a view of part of the north and west end of Boston and Charlestown's City Square area, which were a very congested area in the 1890s. A gathering in City Square. Don't know what the event was, but it might have been the 1898 fire and explosion of the mammoth grain elevator structure at Hoosack Tunnel Docks on Water Street. Thousands viewed the fire and feared it was the Spanish Navy attacking. The building to the far left is the new Rogan Hall building, and then left to right is Park Street, the Bunker Hill Bank, and then a crowded Chelsea Street. Looking from City Square towards Boston is the new 1899 bridge connecting Charlestown and Boston. It was located in between the two existing bridges. The new bridge was built to carry pedestrians and road traffic on one level and the new elevated train on the second level. The L made traveling easier and was at first considered progress, but that thought soon changed. Although it was convenient, it was very noisy and soon devastated life in City Square and all of Main Street. The bridge fence posts were rotated slightly and today are part of the City Square Park fence. A citizens group, the Charlestown Betterment Association, formed in 1901 with the hope to have the L removed or changed into a subway under Main Street. In 1915, the state legislature passed a bill authorizing a subway to be built down Main Street. The Boston Elevated Railway took the matter to court, and the courts ruled that the legislature needed to amend the bill and add a five-cent fare increase. Unfortunately, the year was now 1917, and the United States was now involved with World War I. The bill for the fare increase did not move forward, and Charlestown had this very noisy, dirty L for another 57 years. This view is looking towards an old street named Chambers Street, and to its right is the new Charlestown Bridge. The tall building in the background was a new grain elevator building on Water Street, 
and used by the Boston and Maine Railroad. Traffic impacts even before the arrival of the L required the Victorian Circular Park located in the middle of the square be redesigned to a smaller triangular green space. Above the green space is Rogan Hall, and to the right is Park Street, Chelsea Street, Chambers Street, and the Charlestown Bridge. This view is from the new bridge under construction as it enters City Square, looking towards Main Street. In the middle of the photo is the recently built Rogan Hall. Rogan Hall was well known for having a bowling alley in the basement, and on an upper floor in the 1930s, on Monday and Saturday night, everyone went to the Winter Garden Ballroom to dance. An annual dance with Scotty's Swinging Band was the event of the year. In the 1950s, on the first floor, was the Boston Uniform Company and Wade Button Company. 1915 was also a time for change in the square. The once former City Hall and Town Library was replaced in 1917 with a new courthouse, and for many years it was also a police station shown in blue. The later addition to the Waverley House was torn down in 1917 and replaced by a new Navy YMCA, shown in green, along with Rogan Hall. Next to the new bridge, the railroads built a series of wharves, all linked to the big grain elevator. On the opposite side of the square, the railroads continued the process of filling in the marshes for additional track space. Question. Are the bridge sidewalks wider in 1901 than now? This view from the new bridge is looking towards Main Street. But since the 1990s, the view looks toward Rutherford Ave. This is the City Square L Station. The L and the City Square L Station cut the square in half. A view from the courthouse looking towards Park Street. This view looks toward the so-called High Bridge and to its right, the Low Bridge. A new Sailor's Haven was built in 1905 by the Episcopal City Mission. It was located on the corner of Water and Hudson Street between City Square and the Navy Yard. It had accommodations for seamen at 35 cents a night, including breakfast. On Thursday evenings, an organization known as the Ladies' Aid held dances attended by a carefully selected number of young women from the Forward Watch Club. Today, we would say the location of the building was near the corner of Constitution Road and Warren Street. Here's the German Nazi blimp Hindenburg, May 6, 1937, over City Square. A close-up of the area, now replaced by an interstate highway that was between the training field and Chelsea Street. This once very busy intersection was where Chelsea Street, Henley Street, Chestnut Street, Wapping Street, and Foss Street all came together. Around this mixed-use area were Gordon Drug, Charlie's Restaurant, Shorty's Pool Room, Patricia Joan Beauty Parlor, and the list goes on. Some of these streets still exist, but in a shorter version. During World War II, the Navy Yard played a big part in Charlestown and City Square everyday life. It employed 47,000 people, and when the day's shift ended, around 4 p.m., residents usually stayed in their homes until the workers were safely on their way. In and out of the old gates and up Wapping and Water Streets to City Square has swaggered the rolling, roving, rollicking man behind the gun. Quoted from an article by T. Raining Field in the Charlestown Enterprise. This photo shows old Rutherford Avenue as a proposed widened avenue that would run from Sullivan Square to City Square. It would eventually be built. In the 1970s, a relocated Rutherford Avenue, the one we have today, replaced the old Rutherford Ave as the route for traffic to and from Boston. Charlestown's population now was around 45,000. The Dash Line Light Color Road shows another proposed new road, that was also recommended in 1930, but was not approved. That road would have connected Mystic River traffic to the Prison Point Bridge. 
This was not proposed so that City Square would be less congested, but to lessen traffic time getting through Charlestown. The road would have been 80 feet wide that would begin at Chelsea Street, then go down Adams Street to the training field, which is shown as a proposed traffic rotary. It would then continue behind St. Mary's Church, shown in red, through Sully Square and Monument Ave, gradually turn and go through Pleasant Street at Warren Street, just missing the Warren Tavern building, over to and down Union Street near the back of St. John's Church, also shown in red in the middle of the map. The road would end at another new traffic rotary, where the DCR skating rink, Peter Looney Park, the 99 restaurant are located. This new road would then be at the Charlestown end of the Prison Point Bridge. Also proposed would be a wider Park Street from the new training field rotary to City Square. This road proposal was considered again in 1947, but residents led by Reverend Walcott Cutler were able to defeat the terrible proposal. This scary plan would have resulted in the removal of many homes. The 1846 Boulevard with the name of Park Avenue was designed to be a direct connection from City Square at Park Street to the Bunker Hill Monument, and it also would have gone through the training field if built. The railroad yards to the west of City Square reached their peak in the 1930s. Boston and Maine Railway Yards boasted the largest facilities in the country for the shipment of Maine potatoes that were stored in sheds that were located where Rutherford Avenue is today and between City Square and the Gilmore Bridge. The sheds were destroyed in a fire in 1956. However, competition from the automobile and the interstate highway changed all that. The Mystic River Bridge was built with traffic ramps at Water and Henley Streets. Plans were also underway for a new central artery. Here's a popular restaurant located on the Low Bridge. The YMCA is to the left and the 1917 courthouse with police station to the right. The later addition of the Waverly House was raised in 1917. The remaining original part of the Waverly was torn down between 1930 and 1950. This view of Chelsea Street now lies within City Square Park because of its relocation. This is Boston Uniform Company on Water Street. This one-story building contained the Golden Anchor Pub and the Hollywood Barber Shop on Chelsea Street. This two-story building at the corner of Chelsea and Call Streets contained the Hollywood Theater, a shoe repair store, United National Market, and Silverman's Uniform Store. This area of old Chelsea Street to the right of the Waldorf Cafeteria was where Jack's Bar, Purity Sugar Cone Factory, Sharky's Nightclub, Monroe's Tavern, The Stork Club, and Hollywood Theater coexisted with Jimmy's Barbershop, United Market, Blackie's Army and Navy Store, Lee's Tailor Shop, and even some residential buildings. A side note about the sugar cone factory was the fact that youngsters were given the broken sugar cones as a treat. That is all gone now, along with post-1835 streets that were along the waterfront. The areas now in this view are brick buildings containing condos, office buildings, and some ground floor businesses. Here is the view from the courthouse looking towards Waldorf's, Chelsea Street, and the Morning Glory Bar. Scally's Tavern was nearby. Demolishing buildings for the placement of new support beams that would carry the overhead expressway above City Square. The overhead expressway construction required the removal of the L station's copper roof. Also removed were all the buildings that were in the expressway's path. A community group, the Charlestown Betterman Association, almost succeeded in replacing the L with a subway down Main Street in 1917. Another group in 1975 was successful in relocating it off of Main Street to its present site. The gentleman in the middle, in the suit, was former state representative Gerald Doherty. The highway network was now completed. The central artery ramps to and from the Mystic Bridge had been built by the late 1950s, and by the early 1970s,
the ramps to and from a new I-93 were built high above City Square. The L was removed in 1975, but by this time virtually all of the commercial businesses had left the square. Once a street of fine homes, churches, handsome commercial buildings and stores. The building of the L, World War I and the Great Depression was devastating to Main Street and the area around it. This is how Main Street looked as it approached City Square in 1975. This is before Main Street had a new sidewalk, lights, trees, or street cleaning. The building on the left is the side view of Rogan Hall, and you can even see behind the billboard to the area where an old 19th century building once stood. To the left of that is where the Tontine Crescent condos are today. Here's a view from around 1980. Not in the picture, but just to the right of the yellow brick courthouse, is a building that was for many years the location of the Shamit Bank. Except for traffic traveling on the overhead highway and on the local streets coming and going, we see a mostly lifeless city square. City Square in 1980 shows a blighted and totally paved area, except for a small green traffic island containing the World War II monument. This boarded-up building was located on the now-relocated part of the Charlestown Bridge, Chelsea Street, and the now-gone Chamber Street. It was once the Hoffman Drug Store, and to its right, but not in the photo, was the Bunker Hill Press and the White Tower Restaurant Buildings. The 1937 Rapids Furniture Warehouse was built on the sites of one of the former Tudor Wharf Buildings, E.T. Cowdery Company building and a chair factory building. It occupied the corner of Water Street and the once busy Charles River Avenue. But today, what remains of the old avenue is used as a parking lot for the Marriott Hotel that was built in 1993. Rapids Furniture was destroyed by a fire in 1994. This street was relocated during the Central Artery North Area Project, called the Canna Project to be on the side of and then to the rear of Maxwell Box. The relocated Water Street is now closer to the waterfront as it heads toward where the future Paul Revere Park is today. The street approaching Maxwell Box now is Constitution Road, and where it turns left and then goes to the rear of the building is Water Street. The billboard on the roof was one of many that were once in the city square area. This is Water Street before being relocated closer to the waterfront. The view is from the Charlestown Bridge. Water Street is now Constitution Road. This is the Chelsea Street view from City Square. Here is Chelsea Street looking towards City Square. The overwhelming physical presence of the elevated highway further contributed to the decline of City Square. The Navy Yard was decommissioned in 1974, but one positive note was the removal of the L in 1975. It must have seemed like progress for out-of-towners as far as not having to drive through City Square. The green and blue and red in this photo show buildings in City Square. A citizens group, the North Area Task Force, organized when highway officials decided that the elevated highway should be removed and rebuilt. The NATF and the community successfully worked for over 20 years and with support from state and congressional leaders to convince federal highway officials that the elevated highway should be in a tunnel under City Square. The first tunnel plan called for the tunnel to go underground at City Square, but the highway agencies were persuaded to have the tunnel go underground at Warren Street. Highway plans for new buildings in the middle of City Square were also changed from buildings to being a new park. NATF members from left to right are Bill Lamb, Jim Bradley, Elaine McCarthy, Representative Richard Voke, Co-Chairman Richard Johnston, Dan Kovacevic, Annette Tetchy, and Co-Chairman Ken Stone. Not in the photo are Don Jackson and Steve McHugh. In 1982, funding was approved by Congress to replace the overhead highway with a tunnel under City Square. 
This was done by Massachusetts elected representatives who succeeded in their efforts to convince Congress to restore funding for the City Square highway tunnels. Wonderful support for the project came from former U.S. Senator Paul Songus and former U.S. Representative and Speaker of the House Thomas P. O'Neill, Jr. Standing around a check for $728 million in October of 1989 for the downtown Boston Central Artery Tunnel Project are U.S. Senators John Kerry and Ted Kennedy, Secretary of Transportation Fred Salvucci, Commissioner of the Massachusetts Department of Public Works Jane Garvey, and other state officials. Also in attendance were Charlestown North Area Task Force Chairman Ken Stone, and other members of the Charlestown Neighborhood Group. State plans proposed buildings on Parcel 5, but community meetings were successful in having the parcel designed as a park. Here's a proposed park. This is the archaeologist dig in City Square, looking for the Great House. Here's just a few examples of many of the recovered artifacts by archaeologists. The City Square Tunnel under construction. Road relocations allowed for a larger park than had ever been possible before, with Chelsea Street being relocated 20 feet, more or less, closer to the waterfront, and with the relocation of Rutherford Ave further west. The relocated Chelsea Street was also made wider with a medium strip down the middle, but a big change was with Rutherford Ave. It is now wider, but doesn't go through City Square. That is because it makes a straight connection starting at the Shell Station to almost the middle of the Charlestown Bridge. An example of that dramatic change is the fact that where the old YMCA front door was located would now be in City Square Park, where the fountain is today. The next four slides show different City Square views in 1993, starting with a look towards the Vent Building on Rutherford Avenue. This is a view towards Charlestown Bridge. The view towards Chelsea Street. The view towards Park Street. Bottom center of the slide shows the plan location of a new rebuilt Chelsea Street running parallel to the City Square Tunnel up to the middle of the slide, where a redesigned City Square and Rutherford Ave are. The X on the map is the new proposed City Square Park. This is the view of 20 City Square and Park Street to its left. This is the view looking down a new Chelsea Street towards Rutherford Ave. At the community event for the park opening were Representative Richard Voke. Senate President Tom Birmingham and other top state officials. Celebrating the day with the community were friends of City Square Park Governor Ken Stone and other dedicated members of the Friends. State Representative Richard Voak secured $4 million for City Square Park in 1989. Construction was completed in 1996. Where the fountain is today is where the front door of the YMCA was. The new design for Rutherford Ave between Sullivan Square to City Square, then to Boston. The proposed design for a new bridge from City Square to Boston, replacing the 1899 bridge. Starting in 1614 and every hundred years after that, the city square area has changed 100%. Question. Will history repeat itself in 2114?